Hi there, I'm Simon. Welcome to Film Scene 21. I'm here to give you some real 21st century reviews of film and TV and the ways we can best enjoy them through home media. Today I've got a very nice release of a classic film for you to look at. It's 1991's The Silence of the Lambs. We're going to talk about it now. The Silence of the Lambs was adapted from the best-selling novel by the author Thomas Harris. It stars Jodie Foster as Agent Clarice Starling, who is an FBI trainee. And now she has been assigned to visit this incarcerated serial killer in an effort to glean some information and get some clues as to the whereabouts and the identity of another serial killer who's on the loose known as Buffalo Bill. The man she visits is kept in this gruesome facility. He resides behind this glass wall of a windowless cell this is Dr. Hannibal Lecter, also known as Hannibal the Cannibal. Here we have this psychological gameplay between Agent Starling and Dr. Lecter, where he drip feeds her pieces of information, only in, in response to him gleaning some personal information from her. Now, can he be trusted? Does he have an agenda? Is he being exploited? Or is Agent Starling just a pawn in a greater game run by the FBI? But most important question of all is, will they catch Buffalo Bill before he claims another victim? Just give you a quick rundown who the main players are in this film. You've obviously got Clary Starling, that's Jodie Foster. Then you've got Hannibal the Cannibal, that's played by Anthony Hopkins. We've got um, Scott Glenn, who's Jack Crawford, the agent in charge of the FBI. Anthony Heald plays Dr. Frederick Chilton, who runs the facility. And Ted Levine gives a performance for Buffalo Bill. Filming primarily took place in and around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'll give you a little bit of a rundown on the release that I watched. It was this, the Criterion Collection. Science of the Lambs release, two disc Blu-ray edition. It's spine number 13 for those of you that are interested in that. And it's a lovely release, very nice. It comes in this card slip case with this uh, design on it. Um, back is the usual thing that Criterion do, is just lots of information about the film and itself and the release. Uh, and inside, you can slide this out if it will. That's it. It's got an inner holder, which has got a similar design on it. If I just remove a certain something that's in there, which I'll show you in a minute, and I'll show you the discs inside. The two discs, here we go. And then if you turn the back over, it forms one design, there we go. That's something that's key in the film. Um, so that's very nice. And not only do you get this lovely package, uh, but you get this amazing, well, I can't really call it a booklet, it's more of a book. Um, it's a 56 page book and um, it's got lots of it in photos, pictures, production shots, and um, insights into the film. Uh, it's just phenomenal for anyone who's interested. So there we go, there's some great stuff there. Um, yeah, so it's a really nice release. I'll talk more about the features in a minute. I just wanna give you a quick rundown on my thoughts of the film itself. So let's talk about my thoughts on The Silence of the Lambs. I mean, it's an interesting one because I originally saw it at the theaters um, and when I first saw it, it was it was a, a real a suspenseful, exciting, nerve-wracking experience, mostly because I never really come across a character like Dr. Lecter before, um, and it was really something to behold, especially the performance of Anthony Hopkins. I'd seen it I'd seen it quite a few times in the interim, but I hadn't seen it for quite a while until I watched it the other day. Um, and it's interesting because I actually found the script to be fairly standard fare, um, uh, except for those interchanges between uh, Dr. Lecter and Agent Starling, which were, um, you know, were, were really clever and had some real spark to it. Um, another thing, I didn't think the, the villain had enough sort of screen time. He wasn't fleshed out enough, so I didn't really get to understand much of his motivation or his, his real state of mind or where he was coming from particularly. Uh, so you could definitely have done with more screen time of Buffalo Bill, um, and it also there was also a re really weird, strange um, tug of uh, who is the villain, or is there more than one villain? I mean, it's strange you had uh, Doctor Lecter and Buffalo Bill. Obviously, a lot of the screen time went to Doctor Lecter, understandably, 
I think you should have still had a bit more of that uh, time for, for Bill to sort of explore where he, he was at and where he was coming from. And something else, a lot of the peripheral characters were quite bland, to be honest, um, or just caricatures. Um, so that was that's a little bit disappointing because often in a, in a great film, even though obviously you have these main protagonists, uh, the, the subsidiary characters can still be memorable. And, you know, you walk around, don't forget that guy and that person and that girl. Uh, but there wasn't really much of that here. They weren't particularly memorable, in, in my opinion. Overall, the story direction, it worked. It was a little messy at times, a few contrivances. Um, and another thing, one of the victims would have been nice if they were a little bit more likeable. <laughs> but if you'll know what I mean when you see the film or if you've seen it already. However, the performance of both Hopkins and Foster were excellent, especially Hopkins. Uh, he really gave a believable rendition of the character and infused him with both elegance and menace at the same time and really made good use of facial expression and the use of accent really really impressively well and Jodie Foster is also excellent um, I mean slightly actorly at times but she really does get across this fragility and dogginess to the part of Agent Starling um, I think any shortcomings are possibly down to the fact the writer may well have relished writing for Lecter more than Starling and as most of her scenes are opposite him. Uh, that just highlights it a little bit more than it ordinarily would. Ted Levine gives a really convincing portrayal of Buffalo Bill as a suitably deranged and unhinged individual. Uh, but like I said before, we didn't really get enough meaningful scenes of him. The other characters are all adequate in their portrayal, um, but they're all fairly one dimensional and not particularly memorable. So talking about the look and the feel of the film, um, it has this sort of muted autumnal tones stark look to the film and said cinematography by Tak Fujimoto is commendable without being spectacular which is probably what the director Jonathan Demi was was after um, he also employs a lot of tight shots on characters faces with them looking directly into camera as they speak to each other um, putting you in the shoes of the the other character which really makes them feel like they're talking to you. It's where the film shines best, I think, actually. The rest of it, it, it kind of feels like just a generic late 80s, early 90s thriller, but with, with added menace. The music's by Howard Shaw. He would later go on to work on projects as diverse as things like Lord of the Rings, Seven, and Mrs. Doubtfire. It's suitably ominous and chilling at times, but it, it doesn't really leave you with any lasting themes after the credits roll. It's an adequate, score but not spectacular. Now a few little morsels of information I found out about The Science of the Lambs. Originally actor Gene Hackman was co-producing this project and he was on board to direct and star as agent in charge Jack Crawford probably. Uh, then writer Ted Talley was brought on and for some reason Gene Hackman withdrew from the project. Jonathan Demi was then hired as director and he and Tally worked really well and then we have the film that we get today. Now with regards to casting, Jonathan Demi originally approached for the part of Hannibal Lecter, Sean Connery. He turned it down uh, and then he hired Anthony Hopkins based on his performance in David Lynch's The Elephant Man, which uh, is another review I'll be bringing to you soon. And for the role of Agent Starling, Jonathan Demi actually originally approached Michelle Pfeiffer However, she was a little uncomfortable with the subject matter and turned it down, as did Meg Ryan. Laura Dern was also considered, but the studio didn't really think she was bankable enough. Jodie Foster had been really keen on the part uh, ever since it was announced, and she was hot off an Oscar win for the film The Accused. Uh, and when Jonathan Demi offered her the role, the rest is history, because not only did she nail the performance, but uh, she also bagged another Oscar in, in the process. And also, Anthony Hopkins won an Oscar, so did uh, Jonathan Demi as Best Director, Ted Talley for Best Adapted Screenplay, and the film itself won Best Picture, all of the 1991 Academy Awards. So getting back to this Criterion release, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about the technical specs so that you know what you're, what you're in for if you happen to get hold of this um, issue. Now do, do bear in mind that this is a Region A release, so it's for the North American market predominantly. So make sure that you have, if you do try and get hold of this, that you've got a, either a multi-region 
um, Blu-ray player or a Region A Blu-ray player, and they will have no problems with playing that. Um, alternatively, there are some workarounds on certain UK players. I myself have a Panasonic UB820, which is locked to Region B for the UK. However, there is a little trick that work on some Criterion uh, Region A discs. This one it did work on. Um, you put the disc in, it comes up with a message, this will not play, but then you press it on your remote, you press the button, stop, top menu, voila, up comes the menu screen and you're off to the races. So a little tip there. If you've got any questions about that, just leave it in the comments and I can help you out. So on this Blu-ray, the film is presented its original 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio. Um, it was originally filmed on 35mm colour film and so there will be a layer of grain across the image, um, more predominant at some times than others. However, this does include a 4K restoration that has been approved by cinematographer Tak Fujimoto and is probably the best looking uh, version of this film you're going to get for some time until someone elects to release it onto the full 4K UHD medium. When it comes to audio, you've got two options on this disc. You've got the original 2.0 stereo in DTS HD Master Audio or a similarly flavoured 5.1 surround up mix. I did check out both audio options and they both sound really good. However, I elected to watch the whole film in the 5.1 flavour, um, which was excellent. Um, I just like to enjoy those extra surround um, elements sometimes um, but for those purists out there you do have the 2.0 to enjoy it as well. So with this two disc blu-ray release you are really being spoiled for choice when it comes to the special features. I'll just do a little close-up of the back of the case um, so you can do a freeze frame there if you'd like. But essentially this one obviously houses the film uh, you also get uh, an interview from a critic Maitland McDonough from 2017 and also approximately 38 minutes of uh, deleted scenes which includes outtakes and a phone message from Dr Lecter himself as well and there's also the theatrical trailer on there. Okay when it comes to disc 2 this is where most of the special features are housed. You have a 2005 Laurent Bozzarou produced documentary called Jonathan Demi and Jodie Foster which runs for about 52 minutes you have a 66 minute making of the science of lambs inside the labyrinth documentary from 2001 you have a 2002 episode of the bravo tv series page to screen about the movie that runs for about 41 minutes um, you also have a 2004 interview with howard shaw on making the sound that runs about 16 minutes there was another short feature for 19 minutes called understanding the madness and there is a making of short making of feature it's about eight minutes from 1991 at the time and there is also a storyboard slideshow so there is so much to get your teeth into and don't forget about the booklet that came in the package as well which is just amazing you also get english subtitles on the main feature uh, however there aren't any english subtitles on the special features unfortunately with regards to alternate versions, there is a UK release by MGM, which houses most of these special features as well. as a few very minor exclusives, but unfortunately it doesn't have the 4K restoration image that we have on this, this release here from Criterion. So generally, I would say this Criterion edition is the one to go for. It's got the nicest packaging, it's got the most stylish artwork, I think. Um, it's got the best set of features in one package uh, and it's also got that 4K digital restoration picture. Um, so as long as you're able to play it, I would definitely recommend this one if you're a fan or you want to get to see this film. So, my final thoughts on The Science of the Lambs. I've seen it before in theatres and a few times since, but it's been a long time since I saw it this time around. And my opinion on the film has changed over the years. Um, I think it's just that I've just noticed a few of its shortcomings now. Uh, it's still quite interesting and exciting at times, uh, but really the main two, the main draw are the two leads, let's be honest, and predominantly it's Hannibal Lecter um, and the performance Anthony Hopkins gives for that part. I found the direction to be fairly standard, a few cliched story beats, you know, some of the shocking or, or, or unpleasant scenes sometimes seem to be delivered just to be shocking or distasteful for the sake of it. They don't really feel massively organic to me at times, that's all. Like I said before, a lot of the peripheral characters were, were not that memorable either. Okay, so now's the time when we give this a score out of 10 as I like to do, and I'm sure you're interested to hear what I think in that respect. This may be controversial, but I'm going to give The Science of the Lambs a 6 out of 10. It's entertaining, it's a good film, 
but it's just not one that I would rush back to anytime soon. So I hope you enjoyed that review. If you did, please hit that like button to let me know. And if you want to see more content like this, please subscribe. Um, and if you hit the bell icon, then you'll, you'll get to know as soon as possible when the next video drops. So I'd love to hear from you as well. In the comment section below, let me know. What do you think about the film? Have you got this release? Have you got a different one? Uh, would you like to see the film? Is there any questions you've got about anything else or about this, this review? I'd love to hear from you and we'll start a conversation. This is Simon. This has been Film Scene 21 and I'll see you next time. Bye now.